Dad's been having a word of prayer, so we'll have a word of prayer before we dive in. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time you've given to us this evening. I thank you for all those in attendance. We ask you be with us now as we discuss you and your word, that you would give us wisdom, that you would put grace in our hearts, that you would cause us to love one another, help us to know your will and walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, the first thing I want to do is welcome everybody back after a little bit of a break. It's good to see everybody. Uh, what we're going to do is start lecturing through the theological grounding work that Dad and I did. This is the one volume that he and I co-authored. Uh, he's the number one name on the book. He carried most of the weight. I think I only wrote maybe three or four chapters. So anyway, uh, I have the first lecture, and uh, Dad's going to carry most of that from there. Um let me switch over to my slides really quick. Um, let's see. Um, all right. Actually, probably two. No, that'll do. Okay. All right, so everybody can see the end of the slides. Let's go back to the beginning. All right, so today we're going to be doing scripture as first principle. And the first thing we're going to, I mean, I'm going to go through a couple of slides, but we're going to do an example. And I hope that it makes sense to you. Um, so uh, is anybody familiar with what a first principle is? I've heard of this term before. Uh, it is a common term nowadays, it's not used exactly in the same way, but um, you see it used by Elon Musk. He talks about first principle thinking. Um, and so that's kind of made itself uh, popular. Uh, I can tell you that my experience with it, uh, I haven't had a lot of experience with it academically, uh, except for the work, some of the work that I've done in philosophy. So as far as theology goes, you don't often hear discussions about first principles, and largely because there's this, it seems to me, uh, the issue has to do with uh, circular reasoning, that if you argue in a circle, that's necessarily bad. And uh, tonight we're going to discuss, uh, most of the time it is, uh, you shouldn't argue in a circle, but when you're dealing with first principles, uh, it is not an issue. In fact, you should. Right, it should be circular. So these are the three things we're going to be doing tonight. Um, we have an example, and then um, we're going to talk about an Archimedean point. If you know anything about Archimedes, and then we're going to talk about how it works. So these are the three things. So what I wanted to do is first show you an example. So I, I tried to figure out the best way to do this, and uh, I'm just going to do it right here. I'm going to try to get my camera to point down. And I'm going to unshare my screen. Okay, so let me, um, let me stop the share really quick. All right, so what we have are two cups, okay? Two cups. And tonight, just for an example, um, this is not a first principle yet. We're going to get there in a minute. Uh, this is me. This is me. And uh, this is you. And so there's content in this cup. There's water in this cup. Uh, what we're going to do with this cup, hopefully tonight, is I'm going to take my knowledge and I'm going to pour knowledge into you, okay? And now you're going to have some knowledge, hopefully, Lord willing. And then what happens is, is later, someone else you come in contact with, you're going to take some of your knowledge and you're going to pour it into them, okay? Everybody follow me so far? And so what will happen is, is across time, and if the Lord tarries, Lord willing, orthodoxy will continue to be poured into new souls, right? Each one of us, each individual, all right? So what we want to discuss, though, is what happens, what happens if we have an infinite series of cups? So we're going to actually have them, like, kind of off the screen, all right? Keep going, right? As many cups and as far in either direction as you can think, all right? And so what we're, this is an infinite line of cups, if you can imagine that, an infinite line. And so by virtue of being an infinite line, it has no beginning. 
There's no beginning. And so now we're going to sit here and wait until the truth, right? The water that was being poured out. We're going to sit here and wait until it comes to us. And let's say, let's say this is us in this infinite chain of cups. This is us right here. We're going to wait for the truth to get poured into this cup. Uh, how long do you think it's going to take uh, before truth gets poured into this cup? Anybody want to take a stab? It's never going to. There's never going to ever be any truth poured into this cup because before it gets poured into this cup, it needs to be poured into this one. But it's never going to get poured into this one because there is an infinite chain of cups still waiting to be poured into. An infinite chain. And if they're all waiting to be poured into and we're all the way down this infinite line right here, then we're also waiting. Which means, because it's infinite, it's never going to make it to us. In fact, because it's infinite, it's never even going to make it to the middle. We're never even going to make it to the middle, let alone to our cup. All right? Let alone to an end. Okay? You could do this with truth. Um, and you can also do it with being. If there is no being, let's say that this is my parents to pour being into me, so to speak, so that now I have being, so that I can pour being into my children, so now my children have being, and then they get married and have children and pour being into their children. So with truth and being, if you have an infinite series of instances, you're never going to traverse those instances, which means that you have to have what's called a first cause or a first principle. And this thing has never been poured into. This thing isn't even a solo cup. It has to be a very different thing, a non-solo cup thing. And this thing has never been poured into, but it pours into everything else. And so what we get is this thing. Okay, this thing is not a solo cup. And this thing, for the sake of argument, holds all the water of all truth and all being. And at no point did a solo cup ever pour itself into this being. In fact, this being possessed all truth and all being in and of itself. This thing we call the first cause or a first principle. So then this being pours being into Adam, and now we have being in the world. And then Adam to Cain and Abel, and then, of course, we get Cain and we also get Seth, right? Until you get your parents, until you get today. And the same thing with truth, all right? But if it's all an infinite line of solo cups, you never get truth, and you never get being. Does that make sense? All right. This tells us that it can't be an infinite line. There has to be something that starts the whole thing off. So let's get back to the slides. All right. Let me pick my camera up here. Sorry about that. Okay. So using that example, all right, just hopefully to give you a visual to help you see what exactly we're doing here, is now we're going to ask the question, what is the first principle of theological knowledge? Where did all of us ultimately get our theological knowledge from? And historically, the argument has been that we get our theological knowledge from the Bible. It is the first principle of theological knowledge is scripture. 
the principium cognoscendi, all right? First principle of theological knowledge. So jump up here real quick. No, 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 don't do that. All right, so now let's use another example, hopefully, because I know this can get really heady and I wanted to use as many examples as we could. So what we want to look at is everybody remember Archimedes. Archimedes made the claim that if he had a long enough lever and a place upon which to stand, he could move the whole earth. But the important thing here is, is that he is not on the earth. He has to have a place outside of the earth and from there could move the earth if he had a large enough lever. And so let's begin with what the Bible has to tell us about a place upon which to stand and Archimedean point. And the first place we would go, of course, we could go to Genesis, but I think with regard to scripture specifically, Genesis, of course, definitely speaking about being, but here we have this kind of union. We have the union of word, all right, and being together. And in John 1, 1, we get in the beginning was the word. And the Greek word here is arche, all right? This is where you get um, archetype. And patriarch, all right, are drawn from the word arche. Uh, the language, the, the word arche means, uh, can be used as founder. This is one reason why when we talk about a patriarchy, and it's, um, it's misconstrued, I think, largely in our current culture. But a patriarch is a father founder. And so when we... When we resist the idea of father founding, we're actually resisting the idea of God the Father who founded all of creation. Uh, but that's a side note. The point is, is the scripture here in John 1, 1 is speaking about a first principle. And particularly in the beginning or in the founding of all foundings, we get the word. The word of Christ. Later in our lectures, we're going to talk about, I think it's actually in the next chapter. We're going to talk about the apostolic message that the father sent the son and the son sent the apostles and the apostles gave us the apostolic message, which is recorded in scripture. But the founder, the first principle is the word, is the archetypical word who then gave us the revealed word in scripture. All right. So we begin here with what the Bible has to say about First principles. God, in the person of Christ, who is the word, is the first principle of all revealed word. Any revealed word, Old or New Testament, uh, any word spoken by a prophet, not recorded, any word given by God is found first as a first principle in Christ. And Christ gave us the Holy Scriptures. All right. Mortimer Adler, in the book called The Syntopicon, um, he writes this. For Francis Bacon and for Thomas Aquinas, the only higher science is sacred theology, whose principles are articles of supernatural faith, not axioms of reason. Now, that's not to juxtap juxtapose a uh, faith with reason. Faith can be very reasonable, uh, and reason often employs some kind of faith, some kind of trust um, or you know, precondition, un unsupported precondition. The point here, though, is when it comes to our theology, and I'm going to, I was thinking about how I was going to do it in today's lecture. Uh, when we're talking about theology, we're talking about bibliology. So when we're talking about what is the first principle of theology, we're asking what is the first principle of bibliology? So where do we learn about what the Bible says about itself? That's the question that we're asking tonight. And um, the answer has to be God, God, particularly God's mind. And the revelation of God's mind is only present in the scripture, which means the only place that we can find out about what the Bible or what God has to say about scripture is by looking at scripture. All right. And this is where the question of circularity comes in. We can talk about that later if you want. But because the scripture is the voice, is the word of God, and God is the, the, the picture that is full of all being, right? The picture of water all being and all truth, and he is not poured into, and yet he pours into all things, that God has revealed himself in propositions. 
in revealing himself in propositions, he then tells us what we're supposed to believe about the Bible. We ask the question, well, who are we supposed to appeal to with regard to what the Bible is or its nature? Well, the only person we can appeal to is God. Well, how do we appeal to God? We can only appeal to him by what he has revealed from his own mind, and that is scripture. So we must look to scripture to tell us about scripture. All right. And this is this is fundamentally um, acceptable. It's okay because we're dealing with a first principle. If you can point to me to a greater authority that's beyond God, uh, a greater authority that's beyond what God has said, um, then then you're right. We can't appeal to Scripture as Scripture. We would have to appeal to Scripture and this thing that's kind of beyond God, this thing that's behind him. Um, I think in the chapter I said something like a like a, a pre-divine being, right? A being before God or something like that. Or a supra-divine being, a being that is more powerful than God, which of course is ridiculous as the definition of God goes. Um, anyway, let's move on. Uh, this, I thought, was a good example. Uh, you can find this in C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Right near the beginning, he writes, did the notes write themselves or did something non-note-like write the notes? And this is in the context of him trying to sort out morality and particularly uh, man's relationship to it and his being. And so he, he takes all of life as like a symphony. All, all of creation is a symphony. And so you ask the question whether or not the notes composed reality, composed the symphony of life, or is there a composer that rests outside of the notes, outside of the symphony? Certainly we would say this about music. Bach wrote um, his Fugen D, all right? He wrote that. Um, the notes did not write themselves. The notes didn't get together and say, let's sort out uh, how we're going to arrange ourselves. It took a composer on the outside of the notes, looking at the paper and composing the music. And so Lewis's point is, if we treat all of creation as a piece of music, then it stands to reason that creation did not orchestrate itself. It did not compose itself. It seems that a composer, a composer who has an Archimedean point, so to speak, a composer who is outside of the system, who is... Who is who has a place upon which to stand that is not itself creation? All right. So, I had a few inquiries here. All right, um, and just just to kind of think through the material. So, what is the place upon which we're supposed to stand? Where is our Archimedean point as Christians? A distinctly Christian Archimedean point to make theological claims. Where is that? Uh, we could is is it our heart? Is it our mind? Uh, is it our own creation? Um, some kind of human endeavor? Uh, it does not seem that that's the case. How could that be an Archimedean point? A a place that's outside of the system, a place upon which we could stand, and and from that very ultimately completely objective place be able to make some claim about God's word, all right? The question we want to ask and that I would want to ask those who would oppose our position is something like this. So which is it? Is it notes composing the music or is it a composer notating the music? Um, which, which one is happening? And I'm going to draw this a little bit I'm going to draw this a little bit tighter when we get down to textual criticism proper. But we have to ask the question, does textual criticism occupy an Archimedean point, a, a place outside of the notes, so to speak, a place outside of the music, and are therefore able to look at the sheet of music and create music from it? Um, and if so, uh, what's the argument? And not just the rational argument, which need to be made. What's the theological argument? What does the scripture have to say about whether or not we terrestrial finite beings are able to know and reconstruct the New Testament? How does that work? And then finally, what founds the scriptural word? 
what founds it? Like, what is the what is the ground and foundation? Right. This book is called a theological grounding. Where do we theologically ground every word of Scripture? Every word, uh, because as we've already said in today's class, we 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 are ready to admit that the Scriptures are God speaking. They're God's words. It's God revealing his mind to us. How then are we able to say something like, uh, some words of God are not as important, or that doesn't have any bearing on the interpretation of the text. Uh, but it, But we're ready in the same breath to admit that this apparent innocuous word uh, is from God, is divine revelation. Okay, so then my question is, how are you, what position can you occupy apart from the system to be able to make a claim like that word does not um, uh, mess with or, or impeach interpretation in any way? Um, this is something that we would have, I think, I think we should have an answer for. So how in the end does this work? All right. So just recap before we do this. Um, the scripture is the revealed word of God that God breathed it. The Bible tells us he breathed it and there is no authority. There is no power. There is no supra divine being that rests behind God. So God is like the buck stops here. You can't go any further back. There is no truth or being prior to him. And so he then reveals some measure of his mind to us. Uh, and we would say an in, infinitely small measure of his knowledge to us. He reveals it to us in propositions, uh, in scripture. And so God gives us words and they're his words. And so we have questions. And because we have questions, we come to the Bible and we need answers to these questions. And so we, one of our questions is, can we trust the Bible? Is the Bible a trustworthy source? And the Bible, which is God speaking to us, says, yes, you can. Because the Bible that you have, your Bible, is inspired. Every jot and tittle of your Bible is preserved. Uh, your Bible has been kept pure in all ages. Your Bible, the words of your Bible are forever settled in heaven. The words of your Bible are predestined words. They could only be these words because these are the words that God spoke. This is what your Bible teaches you about whether or not your Bible is trustworthy. And so you operate because you can trust God. God has revealed himself. You ask the Bible a question. Like, can we trust the Bible? And the Bible, which is God's testimony, says, yes, you can. And these are the reasons why. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to us through those words. So what I wanted to do is go to John chapter 10, because I think John chapter 10 is a, a simple example. It's, it's concise, right? It's all just right there in John chapter 10 to give us some sense of, of what happens. The Bible tells us, oh, wait, before we get there, there had this little note. To appeal to the scriptures regarding the scriptures is to appeal to God. So this is why it's not circular reasoning. It's not circular reasoning because you're going back to the explanatory ultimate. You're going back to the first principle. You're going back to the thing that is the source of all knowledge and being. And that thing is God. And God says these things about the Bible. And we would say the Bible like the Bible we have. Like, that's my Bible. He's saying these things about my Bible. And so we believe that. Alternatively, to authoritatively appeal to textual criticism, for example, or scholarship, right? Or because somebody is a professor, has a PhD, to appeal to textual criticism regarding the nature of scripture is to appeal to man who is neither a first principle, which obviously he's not. He's just another solo cup in a long line of solo cups who had his being and his truth, the truth that he possesses, poured into him. And then the source behind that, maybe his parents or his professors, they had truth and being poured into them. And so man cannot be a first principle. He cannot be an explanatory ultimate. It's impossible for him to be these things. And if he cannot be these things, then how can he be considered a thing that somehow objectively stands 
outside the world, so to speak, right, on an Archimedean point and can make a claim about the word of God. When he he doesn't even possess the capacity of that as that kind of being. He can't he he can't even do that because he is a contingent being. This is beyond his the scope of who he is. So he's neither a first principle, nor is he the arche. He is not the ground or foundation of theological knowledge. And honestly, I don't think any of our opponents would say that they are. They wouldn't say, oh, yeah, no, you guys have to come to us because we're the ground and foundation of theological knowledge. They may not say that. But if we were to say things like, no, we don't think that um, that we should take those passages out of the scripture, for example. We should take First John 5, 7 out or the woman caught in adultery, which are, you know, these most hotly debated, right? We don't think we should take them out. Well, as soon as you do that, it's like you get blackballed. You're like a black sheep. Uh, you can't hold that position. You're uh, some kind of zealot or something. You can't just simply believe that the text in your hand is the word of God because the Bible tells you that the text that you're reading, the Bible that you are reading is God's word. And so man is incapable of holding this position. Okay, so I think we're kind of in a jam in a, in a, just a bit. Because if man can't fill the position and God is not here, right? God the Father, of, um, God the Son, right? They are, Christ is seated in the heavenlies right now. And so he's not here with us. This RK, this beginning, this word, this revealer of god's words to us so what are we supposed to do how, how are we supposed to know what is or is not scripture um and later in the book we're going to talk about issues of sanctification and growth um but for now let's just consider this we'll just consider this john chapter 10 oh don't do that so in John chapter 10, the scripture tells us that the sheep hear the voice of Christ. The sheep hear the voice of Christ and what is more, they hear his voice and they don't hear the voice of others. Other people's voices, they will not hear. They will not recognize as their shepherd. And I just wanted you, it, it's interesting why the Lord, of, of the examples that he chooses, you know, I've I've th thought on this several times. He doesn't really re relate to us as as lions. Um, bad guys are related to as wolves. You know, you you're you're trying to think like, Lord, why why sheep? Um, but has anybody ever seen a shepherd call sheep? There's there's some great videos on YouTube watching a shepherd call sheep because sometimes you have multiple flocks in the same area. And so what will happen is the shepherd just walks up to the fence and says a word or makes a sound and only his sheep come to him. Only his sheep. And uh, one thing, I mean, this is, I'm not going to hang my hat on this, but I think it's important to note the sheep do not, they don't sit together and look at each other like, hmm, hmm. Are you sure that that is our shepherd? You know, maybe maybe it's a deep fake. You know, or maybe it's somebody else. They don't do that. As soon as they hear the shepherd's voice, they respond. And I think there's something there's something to that. There is um I don't know, I don't know if you could probably say it about sheep, but there is like it's like intuitive, right? It's you just have a sense. You know, you hear the voice, the tone and everything and you know. Right? So the word that is Jesus Christ speaks in scripture because he is the source of all revealed words. He is the first principle that comes down to us. And the scripture is the revelation of that first principle. The people of God hear the shepherd's voice in the shepherd's words. They know that these words are the shepherd's words and there his voice is found in them. Now, you could try to make the argument, perhaps, that you would say, oh, no, 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 any words could be the shepherd's words. Well, that would be an interesting case to make, but I don't, I don't think, generally speaking, um, if you're orthodox, I don't, I don't think you'd hang your hat there. You would say any words could be the shepherd's words. No, the shepherd has given us certain words, and those words 
uh, bear his voice to us. And then by the power of the indwelling spirit, we receive those words as true because it's not just some kind of fleshly capacity that we have, some human capacity that we have. It is because we are, by the spirit, united to Christ and being united to Christ and uh, possessing or having the indwelling Holy Spirit, we are able to recognize and hear the voice of our shepherd. And this is something that I tried to communicate at the debate. Like, this is how everything in the Christian world works. Everything. Men become better men because the Holy Spirit of God speaks through the word of God. And in speaking through it, Christians hear the voice of the shepherd saying, be a better husband, be a better father, work harder, be diligent, love your wife, be faithful in church, be faithful in giving, right? You grow because the spirit through the word is communicating to you the voice of the shepherd. Anything, how you raise your kids, what jobs you should take, things you should do, things you shouldn't do, things you see around you in your society, in your culture, and you say, that's a good thing, and that's a bad thing. Anything that is anchored in a truly Christian uh, perspective, disposition, can only be because of the grace of God. It can only be because the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, is communicating to us the voice of the shepherd, and it's changing us. It's changing us, the way we think, the way we feel, and therefore the way we act. And so this happens across our relationships, our relationship to government, our relationship to our spouse, our relationship to our church, our relationship to our children, our relationship to our employer. Like, across the board, it changes us. And But then as soon as I say, but you know what else? You know, you know how else it changes us? When the Bible, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the word of God and we hear the voice of the shepherd, it changes us in the way that we treat the Bible. The way we handle the Bible. The conclusions we come to about the Bible. Because just as much as it changes our conclusions about marriage and sexuality and government and good and evil and right and wrong, as it changes us in those things, so it changes us in the way that we treat the Bible. And the way we think about the Bible at, at a base level, so much so that someone could try to co tell, come and tell us, you know what, a man is just whatever he feels like being. And if he doesn't feel like being a man today, he could feel like being something else. And so, you know, and because of personality theory, it's really his personality that matters and it's not the body at all. So the body is just um, is just a um, a resource to be spent however you want. Someone could come and tell you that. Right? Are you just going to give it up? You're like, well, oh, oh, that's an amazing. That's amazing. That really answers a lot of questions for me. Yeah. Now, from a Christian worldview where the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, you possess a conviction. No, you're you're not you're not just going to get bowled over by that, right? You're you're not just going to give up the shepherd's voice and the Holy Spirit's guiding and leading you. And so the same thing goes that just because some guys with a PhD, whether they want to talk to us about gender studies. Or they want to talk to us about textual criticism. It doesn't matter that you're going to make some evidential provincial claim in the moment. You can't just wipe away what I believe about scripture. In fact, the argument that I would make is the only thing that's going to be able to change is if the Holy Spirit of God, through the word of God, shows me, guides me, and directs me to say, you know what, Pete, you've been wrong. That's what it would take. You were wrong about 1 John 5, 7, and you need to let that go. You are believing something about the scripture that is not true. That's what it would take. It takes the leading conviction of the Holy Spirit to do that work. Anyway, let's press on. Oh, wrong way. So sheep do not mount arguments to determine if it is his voice. When you hear his voice, you know it's his voice. Think about it in different terms. Um, anybody, you know, if you have a mom, you love your mom, you know, your mom is still alive. You know, if you hear your mom call your name, like my mom came over to our house uh, this last weekend and she was doing some bee work on our property. We've got three hives of bees. Like 
you know your mom's voice. I don't have to look at my mom. All I have to do is just hear her voice and I know who she is, right? This doesn't take arguments. I don't sit there and pause and freeze for a moment and be like, I don't know, it could be fake. I don't know, it might be some other woman on the property. No, as soon as you hear the voice you know, it's a very similar thing. For the Christian who is a, a sheep, who belongs to the shepherd, they hear his voice in scripture. It speaks to them and changes them, all right? So, but you don't sit there and, and wonder in argumentation about this. And this is how the saint knows what is or is not the word of the shepherd. And this, I think, is what really, really bugs people, um, especially who don't want to hold a distinctly Christian perspective on that. You're telling me that you could know the word of God without doing a lick of textual criticism. And the answer is yes. Yeah. Because there's an actual mechanism going on. There's an actual real person. The Holy Spirit is indwelling the saint. And the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That word is from Christ. The word that is the source of all revealed divine word. And the scripture is his word to us. He is speaking in those words. Those words are his. So we have inspired words, alive words, and an actual person, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And when we hear the word of God and all these things being true, we believe it and it changes us. And so when we hear these words, we know that they are authentic. This is where we're, we're going to get into this a little bit later in the book as well. This is when you begin to speak of things like self-attesting, self-authenticating, self interpreting because the entire mechanism is locked up in the spirit of God speaking through the word of God to the people of God. There is no pre or supra spirit or word. They are the end. The buck stops at God in his word speaking then to us. So this is a, a huge this, I think, is a huge shift in the way that we treat the Bible. Now, let me just do one caveat here. I got We still got some time. Does this mean we should never use evidence and we should never look at the manuscripts and we should never study them and understand them, understand their provenance, look at their history, um, see how maybe they may have come together? Does this mean that we, we should just jettison all that and just be like, the Spirit of God speaks through his words to his people, and that's how we know. And the answer is no, and I'll just say it again, no, all right? Do the work, do the study, but as I've said over and over again, it is not at the top of our decision-making matrix. Textual criticism is not number one in telling us what is or is not the word of God. In fact, it's way, way, way down the line. The number one is the word of God, or the spirit of God, speaking through the word of God to the people of God. That is number one. And then number two, I would say, I'd make the argument that it's not just us, it's not just our time, but generations in the past have experienced the same thing. So now we have to talk about the history of how the word of God has come to us across space and time through the church, not through scholarship, through the church. So that's at least two elements that need to be more primary than present-day scholarship and their opinions about whether or not there should be uh, this or that verse belongs in the Bible. Is it part of the matrix? Sure. Absolutely. It's just not even close to near the top. So, concluding this part, that is from a point beyond the earth, a non-note-like thing, the word, teaches us what is or is not scripture by simply speaking to us. That simple. And in just, just for a second too, and this just occurred to me, if you will accept this position, do you understand how robust this can be? Do you know, if you accept this position is true, did you know that you could have an illiterate child hear the word of God who's, who's saved and indwelled by the Holy Spirit? 
An illiterate child who hears the word of God preached into his ears can know whether it's the word of God or not. He doesn't have to go to seminary. He doesn't have to have a Western education. He doesn't have to have the internet. He doesn't have to have any of these tools. All he has to have is the spirit of God indwelling him and the word of God in his ears. And this will enable a child who can't even read to know what is or is not the word of God, to have the confidence, to have the boldness then that this is the truth. And he hasn't even gotten out of grade school yet. And then that means if it can work for an illiterate child, then it can work for anyone (laughs) who has properly functioning cognitive faculties You can be Joe Schmo, you could be stay-at-home mom, you could be Mr. Plumber, you can be scholar, president, but you can also be a slumdog in India and still know what is the word of God. Now that, now that is powerful. That's powerful. But if we want to say that really the only way you can really know is if you do have a PhD. And you really do understand the intricacies of these theological concepts. And you probably should have a second PhD in text critical work. Um, Some kind of philology or something like that, that would really help you get your head wrapped around uh, these ancient documents and all of the details that are present there. And unless you have that kind of knowledge, it's, you probably, you probably can't know. You probably should just trust us, <laughs> all right? Um, do, do you see the two differences here? Um, can you see how one unites the church? All of us, regardless of where we're from or how much education we have or how much money we have, that we can know that we have the word of God in our hand versus you have to have access to considerable amounts of money for considerable amounts of time to do considerable academic work so that you can finally come to these conclusions. Um, It's very different. The positions are very different on this point. So conclusion, scholarship cannot locate the words of God for us. Evidence alone cannot locate the words of God for us. And why? Why? I think you guys already know. Because scholars and evidence alone are notes on the staff in the symphony of life. They are but notes pretending to compose the music. They think that they are capable of telling us where the notes belong. To compose the song of not life, but to compose the song that is scripture. And because scholars and evidence alone have no place upon which to stand outside of the system, scholars are on, if we're using Archimedes as an example, scholars and evidence are on the earth. They're part of this swirling sphere. They're not outside of it, right? A place upon which to stand so that they could move the earth. No, they're all on the earth which means you have to have something outside of the system. You have to have a composer composing the music that is scripture. And the only thing that that can be is God. And the only revelation that we have of what God has to tell us about what we should believe about the Bible, the knowledge that we should have about the Bible, the only source for that is God's revelation that we call scripture. That's it. You can't go anywhere else. Nowhere else. No other religion. Nothing about nature. You can't go to scholarship. You can't go to artifacts. The only place, the only place that you can garner true theological knowledge about what the Bible is, is the Bible. Because it's God's word to us. So. That takes us to about 50-ish minutes. Does anybody have any questions?
we need to start here because, um, and I wanted to say this beginning and I totally forgot. The entire last series of lectures was about what the Bible says about itself. And that's what we're saying theologically. If we're going to start at a place to figure out what we should believe about the Bible, you have to go through all of the material of what the Bible says about itself, or at least a bunch of it. And so that's why I say, uh, Dad's work on exegetical grounding, like if anybody is going to get any of our books, that's the one that you want. Why? Because that is where the rubber meets the road. That is the first principle. The only place where we glean theological, true theological knowledge is from God's revealed word. So what does the Bible say about itself? And then you got to believe that. And you got to believe that about your Bible. The one in your hand that you raise your kids with and you go to church with and you hear preached out of that Bible. No questions? Tony? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if you caught that lecture. It was either late last week. Um, I, I saved it in my YouTube, but um, I am not hearing you, sir. Might be my hello? fault. Hello? Hello? Tony, I can hear you, but I don't think Pete can hear you. There we go. I'm sorry. Now I can hear you. Go ahead, Tony. I'm sorry. I missed your question. Oh, I was going to say there was a, a lecture that uh, Dan Wallace gave uh, at the Le Lanier Library last week sometime. Okay. And, and, it, and it came up again, and it's sort of something that just keeps coming up where when people talk about text about text criticism, they make the statement, and we do it just like we would treat any other book. And the question right. is always, why? Why would you yeah. treat it like any other book? And that's to me, that's the question that never gets answered. And you know, you went to seminary, I went to seminary, and in class, when we talk about this stuff, we we talk about it. it you know, you know. We, we we don't want to bring in the Bible into what we're doing. It's like, why would I not talk about the Bible when I'm talking about the Bible? The Bible that just doesn't make any any sense. Yeah, man, that is spot on. That's exactly right. Um, and this we kind of get shamed into it. There's this there's this idea that somehow if we don't bring our Christian pre commitments into the discussion, that somehow we're being objective, right? We're not sneaking in our Christian worldview, and we're we're just working with the facts without sneaking in uh, some kind of value, right? This idea of the fact value distinction. But Christians recognize that the resurrection is a fact and that God exists and that's a fact and that he gave us his word, which is a fact. Like the actual inspiration of scripture is a fact. It's just as much of a fact as is we're on a podcast right now that we're having a discussion. But for some reason, somewhere along the line, Christians got this idea that we could achieve some kind of faux objectivity by sidelining our Christian pre-commitments. And what dad and I have been trying to, the case we've been trying to make is no, no, bring them to the front. Make everyone look at them. And so I, I would just ask my text critical brothers and sisters, that you do the same thing, that when you get the New Testament out and you start to work on it and you're dealing with unbelieving colleagues, put your Christian, Christian pre-commitments right out front, that what you're dealing with here is the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the gospel, and that it was given to us by divine revelation, and that it is indeed the first principle of all theological knowledge. Say that. But no, no, they won't. Like they might say it in polite company, like polite Christian company. Um, but you're not going to find any thoroughgoing uh, argument from a text critical, you know, guru making the case like we've just talked about tonight. Because they are, they're going to treat the Bible just like any other book. I'd like to watch that because I, ha I haven't seen any recent stuff by Dr. Wallace in a long time. So I'd like to I'd like to see that lecture. 
All right. Well, if no one else has any other questions, next week what we're going to be doing is Dad's going to start a lecture on canonicity, which is some solid stuff. Um, this is old school Westminster East material that we have been using for literally decades defending the scripture. So, um, and this is the idea of, of Christ being an apostle, an apostle of the Father, and the apostles being sent by the Son, and then the apostolic message. And what the Bible is, is the apostolic message. Um, so, um, anyway, it was really good to see everybody. I say this, I, I know it does that several times too. It is is so great to have you on, to see your faces, to see the names, and uh, and to not just be talking to myself. So, I appreciate it. And, um, of course, if you guys have any other questions, you guys can reach out to us, whether it be on standardsacredtext.com or even in the comments of this video once it goes up. Um, and we will do our best to respond to you. Uh, it's been a really great time having you all here. And uh, Lord willing, we'll keep pressing on. I don't know how many total lectures till we get through this volume, but um, but that's that's the goal, Lord willing. So without anything else, you got, you got something for me, Mark? Uh, no, I just wanted to say thank you for your time. Oh, absolutely. All right. Lord bless you all. We'll see you all later.